thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, this forum. You know, I was uh, I was struck by the uh, the music of uh, Diane's chorus, uh, Wagner's Requiem. Um, I, I'm not quite the classicist that you are, Diane. Um, I, I I come from a more uh, <clears throat> let's say working class uh, musical uh, foundation. Uh, but when we when we when when I conjure up in music that is sufficient to uh, describe the, the topic at hand here, which is nuclear conflict, I, I always get Johnny Cash's uh, song, uh, The Man Comes Around. And uh, the final verse of that, uh, which is spoken uh, by his voice, which is gravelly because he's literally on his deathbed. Uh, you know, and, I, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts. And I looked and beheld a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with them. That's what we live in today. This isn't, you know, some sort of, you know, future look into a hellish earth. Death is on a pale horse riding to us as we speak. And if you don't recognize that, if you're not aware of that, then you're just going to blissfully go to the abyss, the Armageddon that Helga spoke of. We are on the cusp of thermonuclear war. Uh, you know, we, I, I keep hearing people talk about comparing the situation we face today with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Let me tell you something about the Cuban Missile Crisis. A, I was a baby, so I don't know anything firsthand. Uh, but B, I used to be good friends with a gentleman named William Polk, who was right there next to Kennedy when this happened. Um, you know how we avoided nuclear war during the Cuban Missile Crisis? Diplomacy, old-fashioned diplomacy. Americans talking to Russians, Russians talking to Americans. Politically, we may not have been able to do that up front through standard negotiations, but we had back channels that were approved by the President of the United States, by the General Secretary of the Communist Party, um, Khrushchev. But today we don't talk. I mean, yeah, we have our intelligence uh, you know, heads meeting uh, in Ankara and other places around the world, but this isn't a negotiation. Uh, we are in the midst of not just a, a heightening of tensions, um, but we, we lack the mechanisms to resolve these tensions. There is no diplomatic interaction worthy of the name between the United States and Russia today. I just had lunch with, uh, with Anatoly Antonov, uh, the ambassador to Russia. And he, um, he laments the fact that here, here's a man, this is a man because of what you think of Russia, of him personally, I don't care. I really don't. He's a man that sat down across from American negotiators during the administration of Barack Obama and negotiated the New Star Treaty, the last arms control treaty in existence today between the United States and Russia. He was the Russian negotiator. All right. So he's a man who's accomplished far more than any of the people that currently reside in the State Department today in any capacity. Not a single one of them have accomplished what Anatoly Antonov has. And yet he's the ambassador of Russia to the United States and he sits in a gilded cage. He's not allowed to interact. Nobody wants to interact with him. Nothing is happening except this. This is something he has, uh, he has spoken of and senior State Department officials have spoken of. Because at the time I met him, it was on the 35th anniversary of the uh, signing of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. It happens to be a treaty that I played an important part in implementing. Uh, it was signed in uh, December 1987, began implementation in July 1st of 1988. Um, there was a reunion of sorts of all the old INF hands, and uh, we had somebody from the State Department speak there who is asked to be off the record, so I can't identify the individual or the content of their um, their presentation, except to make the following note. There was a widespread recognition on the part of everybody who attended that the State Department no longer had any say whatsoever, any say whatsoever in the nuclear posture of the United States of America. And that when it comes to nuclear issues and matters relating to the nuclear enterprise, the Department of Defense reigns supreme is responsible for every aspect of the nuclear enterprise to this day, to include any notion of arms control negotiations. And when I brought this up to um, Ambassador Antonov, he said, well, 
sadly, you know, because nothing exists in a vacuum, you can't expect the Russians to retain a certain expertise in arms control negotiation if it isn't exercised. It's like any muscle. If you don't exercise it, it atrophies. And the Russian negotiation component has likewise atrophied and stepping into the vacuum is the Russian Ministry of Defense. So we have two, the world's two largest nuclear arsenals and the people responsible for coming up with mechanisms to control these arsenals and hopefully diminish these arsenals are the very same people who are responsible for modernizing these arsenals and making these weapons more relevant to their respective national security postures. Ladies and gentlemen, this is insanity, literally the definition of insanity. I can't come up with a quicker route towards global suicide than the one I just described. Nobody is talking disarmament. Everybody's talking arms race. The Russians are already well ahead. They've lapped us 22 times. They have new missiles, new systems out there that we can't match. Uh, this is a pro tip to all the wonderful U.S. senators out there. Diane, I hope one day you, your name is amongst them. Maybe you can whisper sanity in their ears. All the ones that are there right now, without exception, without exception, believe that the United States is on the right path when it comes to its nuclear uh, enterprise. Um, the Russians will annihilate us in a nuclear conflict. There is no date, debate, no doubting this. We thought at one period of time, back before the Russians completed their current round of modernization, that we might be able to assemble the technology and the tools that would enable us to carry out a decapitation attack, a first strike that could nullify both the Russian leadership, command and control, and the bulk of their strategic arsenal to the extent that whatever was left could be handled by a ballistic missile defense system that we were in the process of installing on a global basis. Say global, Scott, what do you mean? Well, I mean, for instance, not just in Poland, Romania, but every Aegis class cruiser and destroyer has been converted into an anti-ballistic missile platform. And we position them strategically around the world in a way that creates a network of ABM capability. It gives us the belief that we can actually shoot down the Russian missiles. Well, the Russians have not only checked us on this, but checkmated us on this. They have weapons today that, and they're deployed. It's not theoretical weapons, real weapons deployed that nullify all of this. So America has no chance. If we ever initiated something like this, we would be destroyed before the people who initiated realized they had failed. <laughs> That's how quick the Russian retaliation would be. They'd still be thinking, we're winning, we're winning. We're, no, you're dead, you're done, you're gone. Um, and yet we're going to spend trillions of dollars modernizing our own nuclear enterprise now in a furtive hope that somehow we can match the Russians. Well, we can't. I will tell you this without a shadow of a doubt, without fear of contradiction, every weapon system that we are currently talking about employing to replace the existing triad is not sufficient to the task. <laughs> it won't work. Um, and they don't intimidate the Russians at all. So. We, we have this nuclear situation that's out of control and we no longer have the capacity to negotiate. You know, one of, you know in, in the night, and I wrote a book called Disarm in the Time of Perestroika. And I talk about the INF Treaty and the creation of the INF Treaty. And I put it in the environment, I tried to cast it in the environment of the Cold War at the time and how dangerous the times were in the 1980s. Extraordinarily dangerous. In many ways, more dangerous than they are today with the exception that we were talking that we were talking. We actually had negotiators meeting on a regular basis to try and resolve these issues. Um, we came up with a treaty. Why? Because the negotiators were veterans. They'd been doing this a long time. The people sitting at the table talking about START, strategic arms reduction, about INF, intermediate nuclear forces, were people that had negotiated SALT-1, the, the strategic arms limitation talks in the late 60s, early 70s, SALT II in the late 70s, people who had negotiated successfully the anti-ballistic missile treaty, and people who had negotiated a host of other arms control related things, veterans who knew what it was like to sit down across the table from their counterpart and work through seemingly impossible issues to come up with a mutually <laughs> satisfying result. 
and the most mutually satisfying result was the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty that prevented global thermonuclear war, and put us on a path towards potential peaceful coexistence with the Soviets and later the Russians. What happened? The United States withdrew from that treaty in 2019. We withdrew from the ABM Treaty in 2002. We withdrew from the Open Skies Treaty. We've nullified virtually every aspect of the START Treaty except the current iteration, New START, which we're cheating on on a regular basis. What's the hope? Helga, you spoke of the need for discussions, for negotiations. Why in God's name would Russia sit down with the United States at this point for anything, for anything? We're liars, we're cheaters, we can't be trusted. Will we use Europe as an interlocutor? France and Germany can no longer be trusted. Nobody can be trusted. The United Nations Security Council can't be trusted because Minsk was brought to the Security Council, was given a seal of approval by the Security Council, and that means nothing. Who are the Russians going to talk to? Who do the Russians want to talk to? Who are the Russians willing to put their national security on the table and say, here, we're willing to trust you and give up X, Y, and Z to guarantee our future security in exchange for what? Treaties mean nothing to the West. They mean nothing to the United States. They mean, mean nothing to the Security Council of the United Nations. The only way we get out of this, and this is um, a very sad statement on my part, uh, there will be no negotiated settlement. Helga, I wish you the best of luck with the Vatican. I really do. And I hope you prove me wrong. I want you to prove me wrong. I want you to come up with an adequate negotiating form that actually works. But I'm here to tell you right now, Russia will never, ever, ever negotiate with anyone about Ukraine. The only negotiation is going to be similar to that which occurred in Tokyo Bay in September of 1945, when the defeated Japanese were brought on board the USS Missouri, and we told them to sign the paper or die. And Russia is going to end up sitting down across the table from some iteration of a Ukrainian government and tell them, sign the document or die. And a defeated NATO will be sitting in the shadows, no longer having martyr vehicles, leopard vehicles, Bradley vehicles or anything, because all of those will be destroyed on the field of battle by a superior Russian force that is singularly focused on one thing and one thing only, and that is defending the national security of Russia. Now, here's the danger. Because we have people like Jan Stoltenberg and people like you know various American politicians and, uh, and and government officials who have said this is a conflict between NATO and Russia, and they've defined it as an existential conflict. Well, the only side that has an existential stake is Russia. Russia will never allow itself to lose. NATO will lose. The question is, will NATO lose gracefully? We bring up you know um, Dylan Thomas's poem. Is, the, is NATO willing to go gently into the good night? Or is NATO going to rage, rage against the dying of the light? And that's the choice. And, and unfortunately, that's where we come down to. If NATO opts to rage, rage against the dying of the light, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure knowing you. 2023 will be the last year that we're all alive on this planet. Kiss your loved ones goodbye. Do what you need to do. It's over because it will lead to nuclear war. And as Helga said, there are no winners. The only chance for global survival is for NATO to go gracefully, accept the inevitability of its defeat and find a way to deal with a victorious Russia. And it won't be done through negotiations because NATO is not an organization to be trusted ever again. Neither is the United States nor any other nation out there. And this is a sad state of affairs. Russia will no longer be seeking negotiations. Russia will be seeking victory the victory won on the battlefield. And remember, it wasn't Russia that set that term. It was Jan Stoltenberg who said the only way out of Ukraine is on the battlefield. Russia's taking it up. They're doubling down. That's a sad state of affairs. I don't see any way out of this other than through a decisive Russian victory, so decisive that NATO takes a back seat and allows it to occur without risking everything in a futile effort to stop it. Very depressing talk, but we live in depressing times. I'm sorry to bring 2023 in on, uh, on this note. And as I said, Helga, please prove me wrong. Please, Diane, Helga, Stephen, Dennis, everybody listening in, prove me wrong. I would love nothing more than to have this very same assembly this time next year. And you guys sort of chuckle at me going, hey, Ritter, you're a little bit of a gloom and doom kind of guy. Prove me wrong. Because if you can, that means there is hope for humanity, that you can flip the script. Unfortunately, I've given up hope. And I'm sorry to leave on that, uh, 
on that word. But again, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I wish I could stay for the question and answer. Well, thank you very much. Um, do you have a couple minutes? I, I mean, this obviously is why we're doing it. And I'm really glad that you said what you said, because the only way we're going to change it is if people face that that's the situation that we're in. And that's why I'm saying the Kennedy files have to be released. In other words, there has to be a dramatic change in the United States where we demonstrate that we can be trusted because we throw out this criminal force which has been running our administrations at least since the assassination of Kennedy. I would say going back to the death of FDR. Otherwise, I'm afraid you're right, but I just want to see if you can take a minute because Helga may have something and then we'll go just to continue sure. doom and gloom. We'll hear from Steve Starr because, uh, <laughs> but Helga, go ahead. I only, only agree with you in terms of your assessment that the Russians right now have absolutely given up on the West uh, and that they are determined to win on the battlefield. I mean, I fully agree with your assessment on that. The problem is that NATO at this point says, and all the various governments, um, that you know Ukraine absolutely must win, and they will absolutely put in as many weapons and whatnot so that they can. In the meantime, the Ukrainian people are being slaughtered, and I agree. You know, we are sitting on a powder keg where what you are saying could happen any moment. But you know, I take the position that I want to prove you wrong. Uh, because, you know, the alternative is that nobody can discuss who was right, what did we, you know, there will be no afterwards, not a historian, nobody will, will investigate anymore because there is nobody. And since I'm an eternal optimist, I'm a realist, but I'm also an eternal optimist, I think that mankind is the creative species. I do not think that the laws of the universe are such that uh, the increase of the what Vernadsky would call it the noosphere that is the law of the universe and I think that if we do our job right we will catalyze a greater good than this evil is this was the view of Leibniz who said you know that we are gifted with free will and that it is the nature of the human being that when confronted with something absolutely horrible it evokes a higher power of good. And that's what we are trying to do with catalyzing this campaign. And I know many people say, oh, they, they are not for the Pope for this or that reason. But, you know, I think that the uh, offer of the Vatican to, uh, you know, give the venue of the Vatican, which is a beautiful area, you know, and perfectly fitted, um, and I will also prove you wrong on your view on music, and Diane will help me. I'm sure of that, <laughs> because <laughs> this is not this is not a question of working class or not working class. Because you know, I mean, classical music is relevant for the creativity of the mind, but that's another discussion. Um, <laughs> no, but I I think I would really ask everybody, you know, listen to Scott Ritter. He's he's absolutely on the mark about the danger. But, you know, let's not, I mean, the mankind is so beautiful. And I don't want to have a situation where Beethoven composed the Ninth Symphony for nothing because there will be nobody left to listen to it. Um, and all the great works of all the many generations before us and the potential of future generations. I mean, this is a temporary moment where humanity will be tested. Do we have the moral fitness to survive? But I think, you know, the fact that the developing countries, the global south, refuse to be drawn into this geopolitical confrontation. They did not want to join to condemn Russia unilaterally. You know, they say we, the, there is a revival of the non-aligned movement. The spirit of Bandung is alive again. The majority of the countries of the world want to shed colonialism in its modern clothes forever. I see this more as an epochal change. You know, we are at the end of an epoch, the end of an epoch which was dominated by imperialism, colonialism, oligarchy, and suppression of the vast majority of the world. But that vast majority of the world right now is rising, you know, and the fact that you have the BRICS plus 17 countries, you have the SCO, you have uh, many other organizations who 
you know, Lula was asked just now to be a, a mediator, uh, I think by the president of East Timor. And he said that there are many developing countries who want Brazil to take such a mediation role. Now, I personally think that's good. The more people are joining and say there must be diplomacy, the better. But I think that the best way would be uh, to take the offer of the Pope um, you know, I mean, you, you can criticize this or that about the Catholic Church, and there are for sure things which were not perfect, but it's a 2,000 year old institution. It still has the authority of Christianity. It still has the appeal for other religious leaders. I am asking all of you who are listening, help us to get the heads of Islam, of Buddhism, of Hinduism. You know, what we need is a world revolution. And, you know, we have. Uh, issued this call, the danger of World War III makes every citizen automatically a world citizen. So let's form a movement of world citizens, and I have issued the call, world citizens of all countries unite, and those of you who know that I'm coming from Trier may get the irony of why I chose that uh, that slogan, but I hope you take it with humor and not dogmatically, because I'm not advertising any ideology i really want to create uh, i want to create the principle of the coincidence of opposites the you know the higher one the one humanity if people understand that we have to think the one humanity first before geo, geo political or <coughs> national conflict i think we can create a new epoch of mankind completely new era which will be as different as the modern times from the Middle Ages. Let me just say this, Helga, and I say this in sincerity and with a little bit of humor, so don't take it wrong. Um, I was baptized Protestant, um, and I've walked away from organized religion a long time ago because of what I've seen in terms of war and, and conflict, and I've just lost faith. You get the Pope to successfully negotiate into this conflict, he can baptize me in Trevi Fountain. <laughs> All right. You have a deal. <laughs> okay. okay. I go for it. <laughs> All righty. Thank you again for, for having me. Diane, thank Thanks you. Thanks so much, Scott. Okay. Take care. <laughs> okay. So I hope people take that seriously. And um, 